Okay, so hello. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to give my, my talk in English, but I hope you can follow. Anyway, so normally uh, when I say that I work in computational neuroscience, most people have this idea that I work with something like this, the electronic computer brain. It adds, it subtracts, it's fun at parties. <laughs> hmm. Or better yet, something like this. And unfortunately, that's not the case. I mean, that would be quite cool, right? So computational neuroscience is related to medicine. It may not sound like it, but even more importantly, it's critical for trying to understand how the brain works. And if we put in big brain theory into Google, what we'll come up with pretty quickly is this guy, Albert Einstein. And he was the great genius of the 20th century, the father of relativity, the fiend of all hairbrushes. <laughs> and when, uh, seven hours after he died, Doctors removed the brain from his body because they wanted to see whether there was something really special about his brain that could explain why he came up with these great ideas. And here it is. And what they found is that if you look under a microscope, that Einstein's brain is like everybody else's. And that it's a, a complex network of nerve cells. And like we heard in the previous talk, each nerve cell can transmit and interact with its fellow nerve cells. And what they found is that Einstein's brain has the same size and the same number of nerve cells as most other brains. But what they found is that there were more, tended to be more connections between these nerve cells. And they asked, is this important? And the answer was that they couldn't say. And it's only really in the last 15 years that we can try and even start to answer this question. And the problem with this is that the brain is a really difficult thing to study. And if you want to ask the question normally, well, how does something work? Well, say we want to find out how a car works. What we do is we stand there, we have the car come to us. While it's running, we open up the lid. We see what's going on the inside, how the parts are moving. And then if we want to, we can stop the car, take some parts out, then perhaps put the car back together again, and we'll still have a working car and then we're happy because we've understood something about how the car works, <laughs> right? So if we want to try and apply, apply the same logic to say, understand how the brain of a cat works, it's not so simple. <laughs> and if you do this to a cat, normally what will happen is this, right? <laughs> So, but say you manage to convince the cat that this is a really good idea. So you go through and you open up the brain. You're going to have two things that happen. The first is you're going to have a really unhappy cat, right? Followed very closely by a very unworking cat, right? And then you're going to be unhappy too, because you haven't understood anything about how the brain works. And this is a problem that we often have in biology. How do you observe a system while it still has to work? And so in, in neuroscience, we have to work out ways that we can do this. And uh, I should point out that this is actually a human brain, so this is some really freaky smart cat, right? <laughs> so you could use something like magnetic resonance imaging. And this is, these are these really big machines that you see in medical dramas. But that's not going to tell us about how individual nerve cells work, because they only see areas of, of the brain. So instead, what we do is, it was a really old technique, actually, and we take a needle and we stick it in the brain and we can record from one individual nerve cell. And if we have, say, two of them, so here's the needle, and these are the nerve cells, what we can do is we can record from each nerve cell and see how much interaction there is, oh, sorry, how much interaction there is between them. But there's a problem with this approach too, and that is that when we first started using this technique in the middle of the last century, we could record from, say, one to 10 nerve cells. And now, when we do it, we can record from, say, hundreds, if not thousands, of nerve cells. And that sounds really good, right? But it's not. And the problem is that the human brain contains 100,000 million nerve cells. That's a lot. And we don't have that many needles. <laughs> so the problem that we're always going to have is we're going to be sampling something that's much smaller than what the system is that we're observing. But we can actually get around this. But we have to first ask the question, not how do we find out how something works, but how do we find out if something works if we can only see part of it at the one time? So this is not something that's unique to neuroscientists. All scientists have this problem, and it is possible to solve. And in fact, everybody has this problem. How do, if you have a system, how can you work out how it works? And I know that when I first came to Germany, from Australia, I had this problem with, with something very specific to Germany, this really complex system. And I'm not talking about my Steuererklärung. 
I'm talking about football. <laughs> Now, you may have noticed that Australians don't play a lot of football. <laughs> it's okay, I I'm over it, I'm over it. So, but, but if you've never seen the game before, it's kind of a weird thing. And if you wanted to find out how it works, then your best bet is to go and actually watch a game in a stadium. Find a good spot, take your binoculars, and then you can only see, you can see the ball, but you can also see everything else that's going on. And that's great, and you can understand how the game works. But perhaps you can't do that, so instead what you do is you sit home and watch it on TV. And that's okay too. But the problem with that is that the TV camera only ever follows the ball, so we can't see what's going on elsewhere in the field, right? But that's enough. If you watched an entire game, you'd pick up the basic rules, like there's two goals, there are 22 players on the field, you kick the ball, if you're Italian, you cry a lot. <laughs> that's not a rule? Lo <laughs> siento. Okay, so, and then if I were to say to say you, can you make me a model of football? You'd be able to go away and make me something like this. And it's okay, I mean, it's got the basic rules, right? It's a good model, but it's not a great model. And a great model would be something that actually captures the interactions and the dynamics of the team. Because the team is not as good as one player, right? It's the way that the team works together. And this is exactly the same thing as the brain. It's not about how one nerve cell works, it's how they work as a team. And so if we were to try and, and, and answer this and go back to this idea that we have, with one needle we record from one one nerve cell, what we would find if we went back and we started watching on TV, it would be like not that we were watching the ball or the camera was following the ball, it would be instead like the camera was following an individual player and seeing nothing else. And that sounds kind of impossible, but as it turns out, it's actually not that bad because what we can do is if we're clever, we pick a really good player to follow, right? And then what we can do is watch them across different games and across different interactions. And then what we can see is that, okay, we have an idea about how this player interacts with everybody else. And if we do this for different players, what we can see is that there are different playing styles and different role, roles within the playing team. And then when it comes to trying to put it all together, we can say, well, okay, perhaps this guy here is a midfielder and he passes the ball to not just people close by, but also people far away. Or perhaps this guy here is a, is a defense person that he passes only to people that are really close by to him. And we see that we have different populations. And by putting the different populations together, right, what we can see is that if we want to be like Yogi Lo, we can make different styles of game. So perhaps we start off with lots of players who pass it very far, and we find that the ball's going back and forth too much. So we say, no, nope, we want to have more localized playing. So we swap the game, and we play a better game, and then Yogi's happy. So if I came back to you and I said, okay, can you make me a better game now? What you could do is say, okay, I've learned something about the interactions, let's see what I can do. And you might be able to give me this. Ah, you can give me something better than that, you can give me that. <laughs> and don't be, don't be fooled, these games are really fun to play, not because of how good they look, but because of how good the interactions between the, complete, between the computer players are, right? So because now we've somehow we've somehow captured the dynamics and the interactions of the team, we know something about the game, we have a better model. And we didn't have to record every single player. And we find that we can put together different teams and play different styles. So the question is, how good is this when it comes to trying to understand a, a medical disease, like something that affects the brain? And as it happens, I happen to have two uncles, Bob and Bob. My grandparents weren't very original. So it's really actually quite sad because the first Bob has Alzheimer's disease, which is a type of dementia. The second Bob has epilepsy. And what we find is if we go back to this metaphor of how does the, how does the brain as a whole play with the football, then what we can say is, okay, the brain is a really big team in a really big field. And if we say, okay, well, what happens for Alzheimer's Bob, what we can say is that, well, some of the players just don't show up to the game. Even worse, some of them have become really lazy, gone from yellow to blue. Oh, thank you, guys. Okay, you want to find out what happens to my Uncle Bob, I know. So, okay, so what we can say is, okay, so what this means for the team as a whole is that it takes much longer to get a signal from here to there, because we have to start making lots of little passes. And what this means is that the team as a whole stops playing together, so it doesn't play as well as it used to.
Now, if we take epilepsy, Bob, we find that also some nerve cells have died. But even worse, some players ate too much chocolate before they came to the game. So now they're really excited. And they start making passes and making interactions when they shouldn't. And these are these ones here. Now, this is bad enough in itself, but it also really makes it really difficult for the rest of the healthy players, because they see these very excited players playing, and they don't know whether it's really a pass or not. So what it means is that the, the game as a whole is now a lot more excitable, and therefore a lot more chaotic. So it may not sound like these models actually contribute that much, but that's not the case. So what it is, is, is that these models allow us to do something very good. So before I said that we don't know everything that happens in the brain, we know that some nerve cells die, and that some nerve cells become more excitable, but we don't actually know exactly how many of each. So what a model allows us to do is actually test out different configurations, test out different teams. So perhaps we want to test these two teams, and what we can do is we can say, well, what kind of statistics do we get from each team, exactly as we would with a normal football game. And what we can do then is say, OK, which set of statistics is closest to what we see in an actual real brain? And perhaps we find that it's this case. So what we can do is then, and this is very important, we say that this is the closest model to have of what we ac is actually happening in the brain. And by having this model, we can then work out a better way of getting back to a healthy brain. So to answer this question of what good is a model for neuroscience, it's this. It allows us to see that which cannot be seen, that is, the brain in motion. And it allows us to test out different team configurations, find out what happens when they play badly or when they win the World Cup. Thank you very much.